welcome to richplanet.net, the program which aims to uncover the truth behind the alien and UFO mystery. I'm Richard D. Hall, and this week's program is about the phenomena of alien abduction. You would expect that if people made up stories about their own abduction, the description of their experiences would be all quite varied. This is not, however, the case. The same characteristics in abduction cases crop up again and again. A description of a typical abduction starts in one's bedroom or sometimes outdoors with the appearance of a bright light followed by the feeling of complete paralysis apart from being able to move one's eyes. Abductees then describe being taken up and placed in a bright circular room where they are involuntarily examined. The examiners are invariably small and grey with very large eyes, often supervised by larger beings. Instruments unlike standard earth-based surgical instruments are then used to examine and take samples of blood, semen or eggs. The victim is totally paralyzed throughout but experiences a telepathic connection with the alien beings. Often victims remember the controlling influence of the large dark colored eyes and sometimes describe tiny implants being inserted into the head, arm, leg or foot. The main problem for researchers about abduction cases is that victims cannot account for the time during which the abduction took place, sometimes described as missing time. It is believed by abduction investigators that aliens can induce a mental block in the victim's brain so that any memory of the events is obscured. The reason they do this is presumably so their activities and motives can remain hidden from the human race. Abduction researcher Daryl Sims claims that aliens can also plant false memories into the abductee's brain, which he refers to as a screensaver memory. It's quite rare for third parties to actually witness the abduction of an individual. This is because aliens usually choose to operate in a covert manner. However, in a very famous abduction case which took place in 1975, six witnesses observed the abduction of Travis Walton. The seven men were working in a logging crew in a national forest in Arizona. In a recent interview, Walton described his abduction. We had just finished a hard day's work and were headed home. It was starting to get dark. We were driving down this dirt road, if you could call it that. It was more of a trail through the trees and we saw this light coming through the trees. It wasn't like we all saw it at the same time and then said, hey, what's that? All seven of us were sitting there having different conversations amongst us. Then one by one, people started falling silent and looking in the direction I was looking. But as we got closer, we started saying, what the hell is that up there? At first, it wasn't real alarming because it was the deer hunting season. We thought it could be a deer hunter's camp or something. But the closer we got, the stranger it was. We were headed up the ridge, and the trees at the peak of the ridge were to our right. The light seemed to be coming from higher than ground level. It wasn't until we got round this thicket I could see the light coming across the road ahead. And when we got up to this opening, where we could look up through the clearing and see the object, it was unmistakable. It was just coming round, and boom, there it was. Travis then got out of the truck and walked towards the craft. It was just a silly impulse at the time. It was kind of scary. I was just showing off to the guys. A bunch of guys all out there in the woods trying to be tough guys and show each other what we're made of. Kind of competitiveness on the job. This thing was less than 100 feet away. This was not some little point of light in the sky. It was an object giving off light, but we could distinctly see the metallic surface. Travis Walton was then struck by a beam of light from the craft which knocked him out. This was witnessed by the other six crew members who did not hang around for long. The next thing he remembers is lying flat on his back and gradually regaining consciousness. I didn't come to real quickly. I was in and out for a long time. I was in a lot of pain and it seemed like the pain, when it would be worse, would knock me out again. When I finally overcame this, I was struggling to kind of wake up and realize what was going on. At first I didn't know where I was. I didn't even remember approaching the object or anything. 
Then I was thinking that I had been hurt and been taken to hospital because I was laying on my back and there was this light above me, like a light fixture you might see in a doctor's office. When I finally got where I could focus my eyes, I could hear the sound of movement around me. I'm thinking that these are just people taking care of me. But then, when I could focus and I saw the face of this creature, I just flipped out. They were vaguely human. They weren't insect-like or reptilian or anything like that. The eyes were just so overpowering to me. There was something just overpowering about their eyes. Their gaze was just unbearable. Walton then managed to get up off the table and fend off the three alien grey type beings that were examining him. Abduction expert Daryl Sims explains. Uh, the famous Travis Walton case, my friend Travis uh, mm -hmm. found himself on a craft and uh, was more than mortified when he saw these little creatures coming toward him. Mm -hmm. And he picked up something and he said, I don't know what it was, it kind of looked like a big wrench. And he said, I was going to hit him with it, stop him from doing, coming after me. And mm -hmm. he said, at that point, he said, instantly, this large human, very well built, very tall, came in. And all the conversations took place there were mental. And it he was then taken off the craft into a large hangar where he saw other UFOs stationary on the ground. The hangar had some kind of internal artificial light, very similar to normal daylight. This hangar may have been a mothership of some kind. He was then taken to another part of the hangar where he saw two more human beings, one male and one female, who sedated him. He then remembers waking up by the side of a road and catching a glimpse of a craft disappearing into the sky totally silently. He then made his way along the road to a service station where he called his brother-in-law. When he eventually got picked up, he was told to his surprise that he had been missing for five days. It's not just human beings that have been abducted from the earth. The phenomena of cattle abduction and mutilation is very well documented. The small grey type alien is believed to have a diet which consists of bovine soft tissue organs which are liquidized with blood plasma to form a grey semolina like liquid which they then consume. In the following clip, scientist Jacques Vallée describes the characteristics of cattle mutilation. Thousands of bizarre animal mutilations have been discovered, not only in this country, but in Africa, Australia, Brazil, and many European countries, in fact, all over the world. In this country, mutilations have occurred in over 30 states in the last five years alone. Frustrated ranchers and law enforcement officials have come to recognize the classic signature of the mysterious mutilators. Often, in a remote area, a cow will be found dead, the sex organs removed, and the tongue, an ear, and an eye all surgically cut out. The body, more often than not, has been drained of blood, though no blood has been found on the ground. In fact, there are no tracks or prints of any kind near the body. And yet, amazingly enough, there is no evidence of a struggle say uh, 90 to 95 percent of the mutilations will be almost identical. Some part of the face will be gone, exposing nothing but, you know, the jawbone. An eye will be taken, the tongue will be cut out, and an ear will be taken. The rectal area of the animal will be what appears to be bored out. The reproductive organs will be removed. In the case of a cow, the udder will either be entirely removed or parts of it will be removed. Usually, uh, in, again, in probably 90 or 95 percent of the cases, there will be no blood whatsoever in the animal. And there will be no traces of blood on the ground where it, where it fell or where it was mutilated. And all you've got is the carcass and you've got no idea why it died or how it died or how it was mutilated. Not only did we have the, the mutilated dead animals on the prairie, but we also started getting the lights in the sky at night. And I'm talking about four-legged predators. Uh, they'll come in and they'll bite and then they'll pull and they'll tear. Uh, the, uh, the cuts we have, even we can't make cuts like this. We've tried this many times on, our, on dead animals with scalpels, razors, and knives, and we can't make the same cuts. Animals, wild animals, predators, coyotes, uh, won't approach these, these carcasses. 
Dr. William Fitzgerald, runs an animal clinic in Durango, Colorado. Because of his expertise in the field of veterinary medicine, he was asked by the sheriff's office to perform an autopsy on a mutilated cow found in a remote area of state-owned forest. This particular animal had been largely exsanguinated. The anus and about the first four inches of the rectum had been removed. The prepucial skin and the last two or three inches of the penis had been severed flush with the body wall. The left eye had been removed and the last one third of the tongue had been cut. A portion of the lips on the left side of the animal were also sawed off. Exsanguination, the removal of blood from an animal, has been a predominant trademark of the mutilators. Few officials have found an answer to the technique used in this procedure. Dr. Fitzgerald describes what he thinks is the method. If a large bore needle is placed in the animal's juggler vein, while the animal is sedated under anesthesia or awake if you like, somehow restrained, however, the animal's heart will function as a pump and will pump out very nearly all of its blood through that needle. The animal was apparently restrained with something other than ropes. Why, I don't know. It was apparently washed completely clean. Why, I don't know. Uh, and it was in a very remote area. Perhaps these things tie together. Perhaps whoever, whatever, performed this didn't want to be observed. Unidentifiable lights in the sky have appeared in virtually every area of this country which has been plagued by cattle mutilations. But no explanation has been found for these strange sightings. There are some who believe that these objects in the sky are responsible for thousands of mysterious cattle deaths which continue to this day. Many people claim that DNA is the building block of life. I would take issue with that statement. If we consider the human body to be a house, then DNA would be the plan, the blueprint or the instructions of how to build the house, not the blocks. An entire set of instructions is contained inside every cell of the human body within our DNA. Everything in the universe is made of atoms and the atom which I consider the building block of life is carbon. Without carbon there would be no life. Carbon is a very special element because of the way it can bond or link to other atoms. Most elements in our periodic table can bond or link to one or two other atoms. Water for example is made up of two hydrogen atoms that can each link with one other atom and a single oxygen atom that can link to two atoms, thus making H2, two hydrogen atoms, and 1O, one oxygen atom, hence H2O. But carbon is special because it can link with four other atoms, and it is also very happy to link with other carbon atoms. This means that there are thousands of different structures that can exist using the carbon atom as the main building block. Most of the substances we know and love have carbon atoms as their backbone. Carbohydrate, sugar, fatty acids, protein, diamonds. All of these things are made of carbon. All of the cells in our body are held together with molecules comprised mainly of carbon atoms. Man has also used carbon to make non-naturally occurring substances such as polythene and plastic and many other besides these. More recent developments in the use of carbon is in the field of carbon nanotubes. A carbon nanotube like plastic does not occur in nature and is a man-made structure in which carbon is used in a hexagonal lattice formed into a long tube. These structures have immense strength, can be very long and are 50,000 times thinner than a human hair. 
There are all kinds of uses that our scientists propose that carbon nanotubes might be used for in the future, including nanotechnology, i.e. tiny microscopic machines with moving parts, electronics, optics, and other fields such as making new stronger materials could all possibly use carbon nanotubes in the future. However, man has not yet developed technology to put the carbon nanotube to any of these uses. So what does this chemistry lesson have to do with alien implants? Over the last 13 years or so, American surgeon Dr. Roger Lear has supervised the removal of 15 alien implants from within the bodies of human beings. All of the patients claim to have had abduction experiences. Implants are typically found in the head or neck area, arm, leg or foot. A typical implant consists of a small metallic rod about the width of a pencil lead and about 7 millimeters in length. There is never any puncture wound or portal of entry observed with implants, i.e. no evidence of how the implant got into the body. Nor is there ever any evidence of rejection or inflammatory reaction. The object which was removed from Leah's latest patient had areas of biological tissue growing out of the metal and into the person's body. These implants are all provably of unknown manufacture. The metal within the implants has a nickel to iron ratio only found in meteorites. When the most recent implant was examined using an electron microscope, it was found to contain, you guessed it, carbon nanotubes. If somebody has a tiny device in their body which contains carbon nanotubes, then it must have been put there and manufactured by something with intelligence. An intelligence more advanced than our own. Also observed under the microscope were perfectly rectangular sodium chloride crystals, which again do not occur in nature. One implant which he removed consisted of a grey biological membrane, a tiny sac about 7 millimetres in diameter, which when cut open contained a further grey membrane. This inner membrane was so tough it could not be opened with a surgical scalpel. Inside this inner membrane was a tiny triangular object. Another feature of the implants is that they emit radio waves. These are radio waves in the FM band around a frequency of 30 megahertz. The frequency emitted by the devices just so happens to be the frequency band which is reserved for deep space communication. So the next question to ask is what might these implants be for? Well if we knew the answer to that then we would probably know the answer to many other questions such as why are the aliens here in the first place and also why do they not reveal themselves to the public at large? So this is a huge question and Roger Lear and many others are working hard to try and find out the answer. There is as yet no answer to this question. Incidentally this research is not funded by any government they do not seem to want to know about it. I suspect this is because they already know the answers to these questions and would rather the public did not. Most people usually suggest that implants are tracking devices. If only it was that simple. Lear and other researchers do not believe that this is the function of these devices. Implants could be something to do with a long-term genetics program in which the aliens are involved with. Or could it be that at some point in time the aliens will flip a switch and all humans fitted with the devices will become foot soldiers for an alien race and assist them in taking control of the earth. Daryl Sims has also made some fascinating findings about the abduction phenomena. Sims believes that the abduction phenomena runs in families. So if you are an abductee, your parents may also have been abductees. He recently made an astonishing finding. If you get a room full of self-claimed abductees and ask them 
if they believe that their parents are their true parents, a very large percentage will say that they are not. He believes that this could be because the mothers of these people were themselves abducted in the past and artificially inseminated by aliens. He is currently working on a program to perform DNA testing to see if abductees are not actually related to their own parents. He believes that these abductees are genetically modified beings and could be part of a genetics experiment being carried out by the aliens over many years. Other tests which Sims is involved with will try to determine if abductees who live in different parts of the world are actually closely related to each other due to the fact that their DNA came from the same alien's needle. There could be some astonishing revelations in store when the results of this research is published. Many abductees claim to undergo repeat abductions throughout their lives. These people are often first abducted in childhood. My own personal theory on abduction is that the aliens are effectively trying to mimic the process of evolution but in such a way that the resulting life form has the capabilities or characteristics they are trying to create. Once they have this life form, they can then hybridize this with their own species in order to help them correct their own genetic problems so that their own future generations are more perfect than their current model. In short, they are trying to correct defaults in their own species by using customized human DNA. The customization is a slow process which requires many human subjects. So is there any useful information which has come from abductees which teaches us about the characteristics of alien creatures? One abductee interviewed by Daryl Sims was given an insight into the type of society that aliens live in. He's he's, they says, what do you want? And he's, he, said, he said, I had just a moment of weakness, and I looked at him and said, he became a total, total abductee. And they're in the contacting is in the worst sense of the word. And that's what do you mean? He says, I said, I want to stay with you. And it was kind of funny. He says, uh, he says, very emotional. And the entity looked at him and said, that, he said, you can't do that. He said, right. why? And he says, because you're, he said, what he described, and this is kind of important for your, your, your report, I think. Yeah. What he described, he said, there is no such thing as free will here. It's a very militaristic society, very uh, totalitarian right. in every sense of the word. You can't imagine how, uh, it, to a human, it would be just terrible. Mm -hmm. He said, your thinking here is an, like an infestation. Right. The fact that you have free will. Right. And they're, they're terrified that that might get out and <laughs> persuade some of the others right. to do something other than blind obedience and fear. The fact that aliens can abduct human beings and then perform surgical procedures on them without any resistance is quite worrying. It means that they can exercise a degree of control over our mind that renders us totally helpless. But hang on a minute. Are we not being a little hypocritical by taking offense at being tracked by aliens? Consider, if you will, our scientists that study animal behavior who often attach radio tracking devices to record the movements and mating habits of different Earth species. They fire a dart containing an anesthetic to immobilize some unsuspecting creature, then fit the device before releasing the animal back into the wild. An hour or so later, the lion wakes up, trots off, having no recollection of the event, with a newly fitted appendage which it does not understand. Does this sound familiar? Whatever mechanism is used to paralyze humans during abduction, the most plausible explanation is that they somehow control our brain. Perhaps some kind of helmet would be able to screen our brain from this controlling influence and thus prevent an abduction. To prepare for the future, one thing that we might consider is something that will protect us against an abduction threat. Somebody that has already considered this problem 
and invented a device to prevent his brain from being controlled is Michael Menken. His device, the Thought Screen Helmet, prevents telepathic communication between humans and aliens and can be constructed in just four hours. Menken claims that aliens cannot immobilize people wearing the Thought Screen, nor can they control our minds or communicate with them using their telepathy. Some people say, well, if aliens exist, why is it they always land their spaceship on a pumpkin farm in Muggleswick? These people haven't looked beyond their noses and include politicians and anthropologists. I have a picture which I use to describe them. witness the abduction of an individual. This is because aliens usually choose to operate in a covert manner. However, in a very famous abduction case which took place in 1975, six witnesses observed the abduction of Travis Walton. The seven men were working in a logging crew in a national forest in Arizona. In a recent interview, Walton described his abduction. We had just finished a hard day's work and were headed home. It was starting to get dark. We were driving down this d case. The same characteristics in abduction cases crop up again and again. A description of a typical abduction starts in one's bedroom or sometimes outdoors with the appearance of a bright light followed by the feeling of complete paralysis apart from being able to move one's eyes. Abductees then describe being taken up and placed in a bright circular room where they are involuntarily examined. The examiners are invariably small and grey with very large eyes, often supervised by larger beings. Welcome to richplanet.net the program which aims to uncover the truth behind the alien and UFO mystery. I'm Richard D. Hall and this week's program is about the phenomena of alien abduction. You would expect that if people made up stories about their own abduction the description of their experiences would be all quite varied. This is not however the Instruments, unlike standard earth-based surgical instruments, are then used to examine and take samples of blood, semen or eggs. The victim is totally paralyzed throughout, but experiences a telepathic connection with the alien beings. Often, victims remember the controlling influence of the large, dark-colored eyes, and sometimes describe tiny implants being inserted into the head, arm, leg or foot. The main problem for researchers about abduction cases is that victims cannot account for the time during which the abduction took place, sometimes described as missing time. It is believed by abduction investigators that aliens can induce a mental block in the victim's brain so that any memory of the events is obscured. The reason they do this is presumably so their activities and motives can remain hidden from the human race. Abduction researcher Daryl Sims claims that aliens can also plant false memories into the abductee's brain, which he refers to as a screensaver memory. It's quite rare for third parties to actually